right. Hello. Thank you all so much for coming. It's great to be here. Before I get started, I'd like to get to know all of you a little bit. So first of all, who grew up in Florida? Could you please raise your hands? Nice. OK, very good crowd. Who grew up outside of Florida? Could you raise your hands? All right. It's almost 50-50. Nice. I grew up in Maryland, personally. And my third question is, who here is conscious? Please raise your hands. That's encouraging. Great. So everyone who answered yes to that question, my talk should be relevant to you. So the title of my talk is, Why the Heck Are We Conscious? The Hard Problem of Consciousness. And we'll start off with a question. What do bats? zombies, and scientists who never leave their labs have in common. What do these three things share? Any ideas? No sleep. <laughs> no sleep? That's, that's probably relevant. Something about nighttime. But I think you're going to have a little trouble guessing the particular angle I'm going with this, so let's leave it a mystery till the end. Just hold this thought. So before I get into the problem, let's talk about what we can agree on. Hang on just a second. OK, that's better. I'm a little tall. Um, so let's talk about what we can agree on. Everyone agrees that our physical brains support our subjective experiences. In other words, there is a correspondence between the physical processes that occur in our brains and our mental processes meaning our thoughts, emotions, and perceptions. So when certain areas of the brain are active, we have experiences associated with those regions. So for instance, fear is associated with the activation of the amygdala, and memory is associated with the hippocampus. And neuroscientists have made a lot of progress in identifying the nature of these correlations in figuring out which areas of the brain correspond with which types of mental processes, in figuring out which neuronal firings correspond to which types of thoughts, emotions, and perceptions. So that's what everyone agrees on. The question is, how and why? How does a material brain create a subjective first-person perspective? Why are we conscious at all? Because brains are made of matter. And if you look up the word matter in the dictionary, you'll find qualities like matter occupies space and is subject to causation in time and contains rest mass. And there's no hint looking at qualities like that that matter should be capable of producing thoughts, emotions, or perceptions that matter should be capable of having a first-person perspective, a point of view. And so this is a question that scholars have struggled with for years, that on the one hand, we can see this correspondence between mental and physical events, but how do we actually get mental events from something that is made of matter, from a material, physical brain? This is what's called the hard problem of consciousness that even if we successfully explain the correlations between the physical processes that occur in our brains and our mental processes, we still won't have explained the origin of subjective experience. In the sense that we can come up with a nice set of correlations, but we haven't addressed why we're conscious in the first place. How does something made of matter produce emotions, thoughts, and perceptions. That's where we're still in the dark. So let's look at some examples. If I look at a red flower, we can describe that occurrence in physical terms. We can talk about light hitting my retina, this sending off sensory impulses and neuronal impulses, and that's a very valid description of what's happened. This is a physical description of the event. But there's something left out of that description, and that's that rich redness of the flower, the rich hue that is open to me as the observer. 
and someone measuring my brain waves would not have access to that rich redness of the flower. It's embedded in a first-person perspective. So that quality, that qualia of the flower, the redness, that does not seem to be reducible to physical terms because we can describe this physical process without ever even referring to the redness of the flower. It's a similar thing with pain. If I touch a hot stove, we can describe that event in purely physical terms, in terms of sensory and neuronal impulses. But again, there's something left out by the physical description, and that's the fact that it hurts so much. It's that searing, painful mess. And again, someone studying my brain waves they wouldn't have any inclination to clutch their hand and say, ouch, just by seeing that. This is something that is distinctive to me as the observer. And so the physical accounts do a great job of describing consciousness from a third-person perspective. But when it comes to that first-person perspective, the actual experience, the subjective quality of it, these physical accounts just don't seem to be adequate. So in the image up here, this man does not know what this woman is thinking. Probably a somewhat common occurrence. But the thing is, even if he were a neuroscientist and he were to hook up her brain to measure her EEG and her, all of her brainwave patterns, he still would not know subjectively what she was feeling. He could wager a guess what general emotion she had, maybe even particular subjects she was thinking about, but he would not know firsthand what she was feeling. That first-person perspective is just not conveyed through the physical process, and it's not reducible to physical terms. So in a well-known philosophical paper um, called What Is It Like to Be a Bat? Uh, philosopher Thomas Nagel addresses this question, and he talks about bats. And as you know, bats use echolocation to navigate through their surroundings, which is obviously totally different from how we navigate through ours. We rely heavily on our sense of sight. Bats, on the other hand, are sending out impulses and using the echoes to navigate through their environments. And the reason he brings up bats is that their manner of experiencing the world is so different than ours that we could never know what is it like to be a bat. And it doesn't really matter how much we study the brain of bats or their wings or their organs. No matter how much we study from the outside, we can never know subjectively what is it like to be a bat. So this extends to subjective states more broadly, that there's something it is like to be in these states, and that's not accessible from the outside, and it's not explicable in physical terms. So I will never know what it is like to have been born blind, and a person who was born blind won't know what it's like to have been born sighted, and so forth. There are certain things that from the outside simply cannot be conveyed through physical information this quality, subjective quality, of being in a particular state. Another thought experiment that philosophers like to use is that of Mary, the neuroscientist who has never left her lab. And Mary doesn't have much of a life, so she has a lot of time on her hands. And she completely masters knowledge of the physical processes that govern color perception. So she knows everything there is to know about what happens in the brain when we perceive any color. She just has completely mastered that material. But due to her confinement, Mary has never actually seen the color red. And so the thought experiment goes, if you show her the color red, she learns something new, right? Something she did not know before. And yet we've already said that she knew all the physical knowledge there was to know about color perception. So again, there's something about that color, that quality, that subjective experience that is not reducible to the physical. And I promised we'd talk about zombies. Unfortunately, philosophers don't mean disgusting guys like these, these folks. 
They mean people who are just like you and I, except don't have any consciousness. This is just a thought experiment. They're not saying these guys are actually roving around. But it's a thought experiment to show how easy it is to distinguish between our neuronal firings and our conscious experiences. Because it's very easy to imagine someone who could walk and talk and exhibit the external behaviors of another human, but not actually have a, an internal life going on on the inside. Again, not that this actually happens, but it's a way of conceptualizing the difference between mental and physical processes. So I want to turn to two quotes on the subject of the hard problem of consciousness. The first is by biologist Thomas Huxley. And Huxley writes, double check that I've memorized it since it's behind me. <laughs> But what consciousness is, we know not, and how it is that anything so remarkable as a state of consciousness comes about as the result of irritating nervous tissue is just as unaccountable as the appearance of the jinn when Aladdin rubbed his lamp in the story, or as any other ultimate fact of nature. So again, this is a biologist. He, he's totally sold out on the scientific worldview, but he's saying that just by looking at nervous tissue and observing ir irritated nervous tissue, one would never hypothesize that that would lead to a first-person subjective experience, to consciousness, to thoughts, emotions, perceptions, pain, pleasure, all that. So he likens consciousness coming out of these physical processes to a jinn appearing magically from a lamp. And the problem has not gone away. In 2002, philosopher Alva Noe writes, after decades of concerted effort on the part of neuroscientists, psychologists, and philosophers, only one proposition about how the brain makes us conscious how it gives rise to sensation, feeling, subjectivity has emerged unchallenged. We don't have a clue. So again, we have made a lot of progress in identifying these correlations between mental and physical processes, and that's great. But these fundamental questions are still lingering, and it has to do with what is it about the nature of matter that can give rise to subjective experiences, because based on the the attributes that we associate with matter, it seems completely mysterious. So this has been called the explanatory gap, that on the one hand, we have neurons firing, on the other hand, we have consciousness. This is the consciousness we experience every day of our lives. And what fills in that gap? What is it that allows these physical processes to give rise to these mental experiences that give life so much texture and meaning? I'm going to look at some attempts at solving the hard problem. They're probably going to sound trippy, but I think that they're a good illustration of how people are struggling to address this issue and have been doing for centuries. One is called panpsychism. That's essentially the idea that every particle of matter has consciousness, at least in some remedial form. So by consciousness here, we could say aware, some dim awareness of its environment, not necessarily that an atom is sitting there having a thought or a worldview or an emotion, but perhaps some very remedial awareness of its surroundings. And this wouldn't necessarily imply that tables were conscious, for instance, because some panpsychists will say, no, it's all self-organizing systems. They'll make distinctions like that. Or it's the universe as a whole. This view has been associated with philosopher Bertrand Russell, physicist Arthur Eddington, and other scholars. And it's actually starting to gain some credibility in academia because of the potential that it could address the hard problem of consciousness in the sense that rather than consciousness appearing suddenly out of nowhere, once matter reached a certain degree of complexity, it would say, no, there's some remedial form, some very dim form 
of subjective awareness there all along, and that just becomes more and more complex. So that's one approach. Another approach is called the transmission model. That's the idea that consciousness is fundamentally non-local, like a field or a seed, but that it can become localized in individual brains. So you can use the analogy of a radio to understand this concept. A radio does not create radio waves. Radio waves already exist in nature, but what the radio does is it transmits those waves. So similar idea, if consciousness were something permeating reality, some sort of universal field of consciousness, then individual brains could act to localize and channel that consciousness. So that's the theory. And this has been associated with William James, known as the father of American psychology, as well as other scholars. And by the way, this has an interesting implication for death. If, the, if you smash a radio, then you don't hear the radio waves anymore. The radio waves haven't actually disappeared, they're just no longer filtered through that instrument. So in a similar way, theoretically, if the brain dies and conscious experience is no longer there, it doesn't automatically imply that consciousness came from the brain originally. Theoretically, it could have come from this more universal source being channeled with the brain acting as an interface. So just to explain that last concept a little better because it's very abstract and very unusual for us, philosopher David Sharp explains this theory that rather than producing consciousness, and mind, the brain acts as an interface. It receives and filters some of the mental signals while amplifying others. The brain transmits, limits, and focuses consciousness as needed for the survival of the organism. So I'm not expecting you to buy any of those theories, but I do want to um, end with the theme of taking the hard problem of consciousness seriously. And so I'm going to end with a quote by Jaguan Kim, who is a leading voice in contemporary philosophy of mind. To most of us, a fulfilling life, a life that is worth living, is one that is rich and full in qualitative consciousness. We would regard life as impoverished and not fully satisfying if it never included things, experience of things, like the smell of the sea in a cool morning breeze, the lambent play of sunlight on brilliant autumn foliage, the fragrance of a field of lavender in bloom, and the vibrant layered soundscape projected by a string quartet. It is an ironic fact that the felt qualities of conscious experience, perhaps the only things that ultimately matter to us, are often relegated in the rest of philosophy to the shadowy zone between the real and unreal, or even jettisoned outright as artifacts of confused minds. And I missed a phrase there, but Kim also refers to the, or the tendency of philosophers to think of experiences as secondary qualities, so something peripheral, something added on top. And the point he's making is that the tendency of scholars has been to minimize, ignore, or deny the existence of conscious experience because it is not reducible to physical terms. And yet this undermines what makes life worth living. So it seems worthwhile to keep investigating and considering theories to explain how it is that consciousness can come from matter. Thank you. Go to nerdnight.com to find a Nerd Night event near you. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel for our latest presentation.